Hi, and welcome to this discussion on how we approach doing a laser hazard analysis on a handheld welder or a handheld uh, rust remover cleaner. Now, I think what we want to do is uh, start off by just mentioning that this is all, uh, the analysis that we're going to do is based on the ANSI Z136.1 Safe Use of Laser Standard, uh, the 2022 version. Okay, So in this we're going to be using software, but we're also going to briefly at least a touch on the equations used in the ANSI standard because we're going to get some useful information out of that and for those of you who may want to try some of this uh, the stuff by hand by using equations like when we're calculating uh, the NOHD uh, or the NSHD which is the nominal skin hazard distance you know you may want to use equations and so you hand calculating either to verify the software or having the software verify your hand calculations we want to at least touch on those equations and there are some a couple of important uh, points that we want to bring out on why we're going to, um, when we're looking at some of the information that we're going to use to do the analysis, why we uh, pick certain um, criteria for uh, the parameters that we'll be working with. Okay, so uh, I think uh, let's get started by talking about what is the difference between a handheld wel uh, welder and a handheld rust remover cleaner. And basically the difference is that in a handheld rust remover or cleaner, when the beam exits the uh, handheld piece, the beam is usually me uh, moving. It's uh, scanning. Okay, whereas in a handheld welder, the beam comes out and it's static. So both beams uh, go through a focusing lens. For the welder, it goes through the fo focusing lens and comes out uh, the handheld piece. For the rust remover cleaner, it goes through the focusing lens and then hits a scanner that gives us the scan rate. But for most of the handheld rust remover cleaners, that scan rate, you're generally working somewhere between, uh, well, zero and 100 hertz. But for most of them, you can set it to a zero scan rate for uh, so that it's a static beam. In that case, we ha we look at it the same way that we look at the handheld welder, and of course that would be the worst case. If if you say, well, I'm uh, you know what we use, it's the system has happens to be interlocked for the rust remover cleaner. The beam has to always be scanning. That is a more complicated. Uh, analysis than what we want to do here because then we're looking at a scanning scanning beam uh, and that beam is is uh, at some repetition rate passing the limiting aperture of the eye and creating pulses in the eye and there's a lot more to that so we're going to stick with a static beam that way we can work both the handheld welder and the rust remover cleaner as the we can treat them the same and uh, we'll just find the calculation to be easy and uh, much easier and uh, see that it would give us a worst case scenario okay I think that's about all so with that let's get started with some of the information uh, we're going to used to do the analysis and this information is based on what you can most likely get from a manufacturer's spec sheet like if you visit their website now if you talk to the manufacturer directly you may be able to get all the information you need but I think for this analysis we want to do a little something where we may not have all the information and how do we determine what should we use to do a, a good analysis a conservative analysis not too conservative but a conservative analysis when we need to uh, do an educated guess at a parameter when we're not given all the information. Okay, so with that, let's get started here. So the first thing that uh, all these systems have in common is that they're a uh, fiber laser. Typically, uh, they're a euterbium fiber, and euterbium fiber, uh, it's a euterbium doped fiber laser 
And that output can be anywhere from about uh, 1010 nanometers to 1080. Now, these systems are uh, uh, selected at, uh, they run at 1070, uh, 1070 nanometers, and that's what we'll be working with here. With uh, uh, And we're going to work with a power level that's sort of standard with these units at uh, 1.5 kilowatts. Okay, so we're going to be looking at a couple of different fibers here. Sometimes they can be a single mode fiber and a multi mode fiber. Uh, these multi mode fibers can be 50 microns, 100 microns, 200 microns, 3, 4, 600 microns. But um, kind of seeing a lot of these uh, handheld using multi mode fibers of 50 microns. The other thing, and, and Typically, you'll be given, you'll know what the uh, fiber diameter is that's being used. And when we say this is a fiber diameter of 50 microns, we're going to assume that that's the beam diameter coming out of the fiber. Okay. Then they uh, are coupled with a collimating lens that collimates the beam here. So this is the collimating lens. Okay, and we're going to calculate something called the angle subtended. You can see that we've already done the calculation here, but we'll get to that in just a second. The other thing that we see in these units can be a single mode fiber, and for a 1070 nanometer uh, output, that single mode fiber will be somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 to 14 microns. So we're going to go with 12.5 uh, microns, okay, and that's going to work just fine for what we're doing. Now it'll have, a, uh, also it might have a little longer focal length because uh, this, it'll produce a little uh, smaller spot on the lens, so we move this lens out a little bit to reduce the uh, irradiance on the lens. And then, of course, uh, using uh, the information given, we can calculate the angle subtended. Why do we care about the angle subtended? Okay. So the beam divergence coming out of the collimating lens, the minimum beam divergence is equal to the angle subtended. Okay. So that's the, the lowest beam divergence we can have. And we want to work with the lowest beam divergence because that, that is our worst case when we're doing this calculation. Uh, ultimately, when we get to the final calculation, we're going to calculate the spot size achieved by the focusing lens. Okay. And so how do we calculate the angle subtended? And what is the angle subtended? The angle subtended is the angle looking from the lens back at the fiber. Okay. And this is the angle right here. All right. So you take the fiber diameter, divide it by the focal length, Okay, and that will give you the angle subtended, and that will be your minimum beam divergence coming out of this collimating lens. It's as simple as that. So when we look at a 50 micron fiber diameter divided by a 40 millimeter focal length collimating lens, we get an angle subtended of 1.25 milliradians. When we have a single mode fiber at 12.5 microns, collimating uh, lens focal length of 50 millimeters, we'll get an angle subtended of a quarter of a milliradian. Okay. All right now, there's one thing I mentioned uh, just show on here is that if you have a, a multi when you work with a multi-mode fiber, oftentimes for the multi-mode fiber you're given the numerical aperture and the, and the numerical aperture might be 0 0.1, might be 0 0.2, 0 0.22. Uh, let's say it's 0.2. That numerical aperture represents the half angle beam divergence coming out of the fiber. Okay, and uh, so that's why we say the full angle is twice the numerical aperture. But what we have to know is what is it measured in, and we're going to talk about the different measurement where measurement criteria, whether it's uh, one over e, one over e squared, or one over e cubed. That becomes important, and um, I'll show you that in the ANSI equations. But I'll tell you right now that. As far as the ANSI standard goes, for the equation used for calculating the nominal ocular hazard distance for multimode fiber, where the numerical aperture is used, it's assuming that uh, measurement criteria is 1 over E cubed. And we need to know that because that means that this diameter here that we're using as the beam diameter, that is in 1 over E cubed also. In laser safety, we work in 1 over E, so we'll need to know how to convert that. But most laser manufacturers, when they give you data, they'll give it to you in 1 over E squared. 
All right. So when we do this, when we work this analysis in the software, we'll be using 1 over e squared. Okay, because that's typically what manufacturers give you data as. Now, if you're working these by hand, whatever data you get, you're going to have to convert them to 1 over e to use ANSI equations. Uh, but if we're using the software, we can input them as 1 over e squared, basically what we typically get for manufacturers, and the software will convert for 1 over e. We don't do, we don't have a switch in the software for 1 over e cubed because it's seldom used and the only time we really use it is that you see it is when it's associated with the numerical aperture uh, the way the uh, ANSI standard interprets it. Okay, so let's move on now that we've talked a little bit about that and we'll, we'll go over that some more. Alright, so as I just mentioned these are the um, measurement criteria in laser safety, we work in uh, 1 over E because if we measure a beam in 1 over E and the diameter in 1 over E and then we calculate the irradiance, based on that diameter it will give us peak irradiance. The tables in the ANSI standard for uh, looking up the maximum permissible exposure limit, the MPEs, so the MPE tables, they're normalized to peak irradiance. Okay, so that's the reason, uh, yeah, we work in peak irradiance. If it had been normalized for 1 over e squared, we'd still get the same results, and we'd be working in 1 over e squared, but those tables are normalized in 1 over e peak irradiance. Manufacturers give it in 1 over e squared, that gives us average irradiance, and, I, and as I pointed out, in the one case for numerical aperture, we kind of need to know this 1 over e cubed. How do we make the conversions? Well, if I'm given information in 1 over e squared, I divide it by the square root of 2, that will convert it to 1 over e information. If it's in 1 over e cubed, I divide the 1 over e cubed information by the square root of 3, and that will give me uh, the information in 1 over e. Okay. Um, now, here's what we're after. We're really after this uh, spot size that is created by the focusing lens. Now we're gonna uh, we're just uh, using sort of some typical numbers that we see out in the industry. So we're gonna use a focal length of 120 millimeters here. Okay, so this is our focal length, 120 millimeters. This spot size is approximately equal to the focal length times the divergence coming into this lens. Well, what is that divergence? Well, this, this is the beam coming from our collimating lens. For the multimode fiber, that was 1.25 milliradians. If we do this calculation, that comes out to be 150 uh, microns. But as we've talked, because this is a multimode fiber, and originally this starts out looking at uh, the beam coming out of that fiber, we have to assume it's in 1 over e cubed, and we're going to convert that to 1 over e squared to use in the software. Okay, which this makes it kind of fun. So how do we do that? Well, to get to 1 over e, we divide this 150 microns by the square root of 3. And then to get to 1 over e squared, we take the 1 over e uh, value and we multiply that by the square root of 2. And that gives us 122 microns. So that's what we'll be using is 122 microns. Now for the single mode fiber, okay, we have the 120 millimeter focal length lens. We know our beam divergence coming into the uh, focusing lens is 0.25 milliradians. That gives us a beam diameter in 1 over e squared of 30 microns. How do I know it's 1 over e squared? Okay, for a single mode fiber, okay, oops, sorry. Back up one more. Oh, there we go. Okay, so for a single mode fiber, for, <laughs> I'll get my act together here in a minute. For a single mode fiber, this uh, fiber diameter that's given for a single mode fiber is often called the mode field diameter. And by definition, that mode field diameter, we can use that as the beam diameter at right at the fiber in 1 over e squared by definition. Okay, so that means that uh, the diameter we're given for a single mode fiber already comes to us 
and 1 over e squared. So once we do this calculation based on the uh, single mode fiber diameter or the mode fill diameter, if it's given as mode fill diameter, we just simply do this calculation and that gives us the spot size in 1 over e squared and that's going to be 30 microns. Okay, I think that about covers it. Let's go touch on the uh, ANSI equations quickly. And um, so that you'll understand why we're talking about this 1 over e cubed and, and why we think it's uh, 1 over e cubed. And since we're uh, want to, since we're doing all this analysis by the ANSI standard, we need to make sure that we kind of stay within how the standard is defining things. So these are the um, NHC concepts, okay, nominal ocular hazard distance. This is the intrabeam coming straight out of the laser. Lens on laser uh, is uh, where we have a laser focused down by lens. So this is sort of what we're looking at here. We have diffuse reflections, and then we have, of course, fiber optic uh, uh, nominal ocular hazard distance, which is uh, both single mode and multi-mode. Now, uh, we're going to look at the equations. Let's look at this. But these are uh, the first uh, thing. This, the lens on laser, the intrabeam lens on laser and fiber optic, they all use the same equation. They're just rearranged a little bit based on the information you're given. But they're really the same equation. They're a beam propagation equation. Okay. So let's continue on and take a look here. Uh, you know, let me go back and mention something. And this diffuse reflection is something we're going to look at also, because a lot of cases, this is really what we're uh, more worried about on these units is um, uh, really about what the the scattered beam is. Like if you're doing a weld or you're doing some cleaning, what what happens when the beam if you lose coupling and we reflect a lot of the power, uh, the uh, not reflect but uh, scatter the power. Uh, from the focal point, it gets scattered. That's why we look at the diffuse reflection. It tells us the hazard of the diffuse reflection, and we'll take a look at that in the software in just a moment. Okay, so um, let's move on. So this is the intrabeam uh, formula, okay? And we'll uh, see that this formula is pretty much the, uh, the same in all the calculations, except for the diffuse. Okay, but for the lens on laser and all the uh, fiber stuff, multi-mode and single mode, this this is really the equation being used. And you can see that it starts off with uh, when it's uh, uh, the way the equation is derived for the nominal ocular hazard distance. We have this term right in front, which is 1 over the divergence. Okay, And you can see we have, uh, this is the divergence angle right here, the far field divergence angle. This is the beam diameter. It looks like it's the beam diameter of the aperture, but really, this is the beam diameter at the waist. All beam propagation formulas, I don't care what they are, they're really looking at the beam waist and the uh, divergence associated with that beam waist. So you have this beam waist and you have this divergence. They are intimately connected. Okay, So anytime we are doing beam propagation we really want to know what that beam what the beam diameter at the waist is and the divergence, the far field divergence associated with that beam diameter. Alright, so let's go back. Okay, so here we are. We have uh, this equation this is 1 over the divergence. Let's go take a look at the lens on laser. Now, this, you'll notice the equation is about the same other than that little minus a squared, which was the beam diameter or the beam diameter waste for the intrabeam. That gets dropped because this, di this is the diameter that they would be talking about. It's so small that it's negligible. We don't need we don't need to include that. We can just drop it out of the equation because it's so small, it's insignificant in the calculation. But this f over b, which is the focal length of the lens, divided by the beam diameter coming into the lens, this is the uh, term we saw in the previous equation. This is 1 over the uh, beam divergence. Okay. Okay. So, we're going to, instead of looking at the software and calculating lens on laser, we're going to be using the intrabeam because, as I said, they're the same thing. And you'll see what I'm talking about in just a second. Let's go take a look at the next one, which is a multimode fiber. And you'll notice here in the multimode fiber, again, this term right here, 1.7 over the numerical aperture. 
Okay, so when you're using the ANSI equation, you're going to want the numerical aperture uh, for this equation. Now, normally this would be written 1 over 2 times the numerical aperture divided by the square root of 3. Why? Well, that's because it has to be converted to 1 over e. How do I know that? This 1.7. The square root of 3 is 1.73, so this has been rounded to 1.7. This indicates that this uh, numerical aperture, which we're using for the divergence, has been, uh, uh, is interpreted as 1 over e cubed, the divergence in 1 over e cubed by the standard. And this 1.7 is taking that 1 over e cubed divergence and converting it to 1 over e. All right. And next, the single mode fiber. This is what's called uh, omega naught, which is the mode field diameter. Okay, and uh, technically, this would have had a square root of two under it, but we move that inside the square root, and there's this two setting in here. Uh, now, there were some other numbers that get canceled out and stuff, so we don't see the two setting up here. Okay, but it was it was in here and it gets canceled out because it was like two over four, which gives us just one over two. So the mode field diameter, or the diameter of the single mode fiber, is always in one over e squared already for us. Okay, so let me see. Uh, And this is the diffuse reflection. Okay, this is the equation for it, which we do want to take a look at because you may want to use that if you're calculating a diffuse reflection hazard, the nominal hazard zone. Uh, we have a couple of terms, rho and uh, uh, phi, where uh, we're using, I'm sorry, <laughs> theta. Theta is the one I uh, almost got confused there. Uh, rho, which is the spectral reflectivity. It tells us how much power is being reflected off the surface or scattered off the surface. When rho is 1, it's saying 100% of the power is being scattered off the surface, and we usually set rho to 1 so that we get a worst case calculation. And the cosine of theta, theta is the viewing angle. Uh, uh, f uh, from the observer's point of view. It's not the angle that the laser is set at in coming into the surface. It's the viewing angle. We usually set that to zero so that we get a worst case calculation. All right. I think that's about it. Let's go start doing some work here. As I said, the wavelength is 1070. We have an average power of 1.5 kilowatts. That's 1500 watts or 1.5 e to the 3. Okay, you can also put 1500 in here, but it's going to convert it to scientific notation. We're going to use the ANSI default exposure duration of 10 seconds for this calculation. Okay, now what we said before is we had calculated uh, the spot size after the focusing lens. Now, why don't we consider anything other than what comes out of the handheld? I mean, we have a fiber there. Why don't we do the analysis on the output? Of coming out of the fiber and that's because we're only concerned with the analysis when this system is in what we call normal operation and normal operation means we don't have access direct access to the output of the fiber it's only what comes out of the handheld piece and that means we're looking at a, uh, the output of the laser coming through a focusing lens and uh, that's all we're going to be concerned with Okay, and so we do analysis. This analysis is based on normal operation, how these are normally used. So we're only concerned with what's coming out of the handheld piece. So we know that the spot size that we calculated in 1 over e squared is 0 0.122 microns. Divergence. Well, that's a good question. We don't know what the divergence is. Uh, one thing we're going to use here is the m squared diffraction limit. Okay, m squared is a, some people call it a beam quality factor, it's really a beam propagation factor. And it gives us some information about the beam, such as if we know what the m squared is of a beam, and we know either the diameter or the divergence, we can couple it with the m squared and uh, you can then calculate the information you don't have. So in this case, if we have the m squared of the laser beam, then we uh, we can calculate the divergence. L let me go uh, back and take a look at something here. 
so that we can talk about that. Okay, so this is a perfect Gaussian beam. Okay, these are, uh, this is very near a perfect Gaussian beam. And for a perfect Gaussian beam, m squared is 1. m squared can never be less than 1. That's a theoretical limit. Then, as we begin getting more, uh, you know, not so perfect Gaussian, less than perfect, we call these more multi-mode beams, m squared goes up. So this beam would, has a higher m squared than this has. This beam right here would be somewhere between like uh, 1.01 and 1.05. And then we start going up in m squared. They can go up, you know, to uh, m squared of 1.5, uh, m squared of 2, m squared of 20, m squared of 40, depending on what they are. If you're looking at like a top hat beam getting up in here, they're going to have very high m squared values. But you can see that uh, this beam will have a higher m squared than this one would have. So, I just wanted to point that out that we use m squared a lot. Right? Now, let me go back to the software. So we kind of want to figure out what m squared is. Often a manufacturer will either give you the m squared value of the beam or they give it to you in, in another term called the beam parameter product, which is very much the same thing as m squared. And I'm going to show you if you get that, how to convert that to m squared in just a moment. Okay, but first we need to kind of figure out for a multi-mode beam, 50 micron, uh, you know, what would that be? And I'm going to say for a 1.5 kilowatt for a 50 micron fiber, it's going to be somewhere, say, between 1.5 and 2. And I, I can show you a little bit of how uh, we know a little bit about this. So let's go take a look at something. Uh, this is a paper uh, written by the Welding Institute. It was uh, given at uh, Cali, uh, Calio in 2005. It's a really good paper. This is about welding with different types of lasers. One of them we're going to look at is the exact laser we're talking about, this euterbium fiber laser. It has a uh, delivery fiber diameter of 100 microns, so it's twice the diameter that we're looking at. Collimating focal length Collimating lens focal length of 120 millimeters, a bit longer than what we're looking at. Uh, two different focal length lenses, and then here's the nominal beam waste calculated. If you do the exact calculation we just talked about, about how you calculate this um, uh, beam waste diameter, excuse me. Okay, you you can go through and do the calculation based on the fiber diameter, the collimating lens, and the lens focal length, and you will be able to, uh, you'll come up with these values. But right down here, you'll see that the beam uh, parameter product is listed, and it's listed at four, and you'll see that we're they're using a, a, a laser with higher power, four kilowatts. Okay, so if we kind of took 1.5 kilowatts, we kind of divide it by... Uh, uh, you know, 4,000, we're going to know, uh, well, I, I don't want to get into that. When you run lower power, you'll have a little better uh, 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 beam quality or beam uh, propagating factor than for higher power. Also, we have a beam diameter of 0.1 versus f uh, our 50 micron. So this is going to be our 100 micron versus 50 micron. So really what that tells us is that this, this beam is running a little higher, more multi-mode, uh, a little higher m squared value than what we would be looking at. And as I said, we're really going to be looking at, if we're looking at half the fiber diameter, we're going to be looking at around 2, and because we're at a lower power, uh, we'd see a beam parameter product somewhere between, you know, probably a 1.5 to 2. Okay, and so uh, we'll 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 do something that is conserv it's conservative, and it'll work. We're going to say that we have a beam product parameter of 1.75, but how do we convert that? So let me show you. Uh, you can go to a um, website called RP Photonics Encyclopedia. Okay, so we're going to go to that. We're going to do articles A to Z. We'll do beam, and we're going to look for beam parameter product. It's right here. We're going to click on that. We're going to come down and we get a calculator. So the first thing we're going to do is turn this into 1070 nanometers and then we're going to do our beam pro uh, parameter product. We're going to put uh, 1.75 in there and then you say 
Okay, we want dm squared calculated from uh, the beam parameter product. We hit this and it tells us dm squared is uh, 5.14. And that sounds about right for this. If we used 1.5, all right, that gives us a, a pretty low m squared. It's, it's, you know, and you may want to go a little more conservative. I think 1.75 is going to be a, a nice conservative and realistic value for us to use, and it's going to give us a good analysis. So we'll go with, uh, we'll say uh, 5.1. Okay, we'll go with 5. We'll round that down to 5.1, and we'll go with that. So now we have an m squared value. And so we're going to input that as 5.1, okay? And what the software does, or what you can do by hand, is then uh, calculate the divergence, okay? This tells us uh, what, uh, at the observer range of 0.1 uh, meters, that's the closest we ever do any analysis, uh, it tells us what the beam diameter is at 10 centimeters away from this focus spot. Now, what we may want to know, uh, just out of curiosity, is what is the beam diameter at the focusing lens? Let's go back here and look up here. So if we set a distance and we know that our uh, focusing lens is 120 millimeter focal length, so if we say if we put an observer range of 120, milli, uh, 120 millimeters or 0.12 meters, that will tell us what the beam diameter is out here. Well, it will also tell us uh, what the beam diameter is 120 millimeters on the other side of this beam waist where the focusing lens would be. So let's go do that. Let's put in 0 0.12 and we can see that our beam diameter would be about 6.8 uh, millimeters at focusing lens. All right, so now we can get all the necessary information we want. Let's think about what would be realistic for uh, an observer range. Well, I think realistic would be about a half a meter. You can certainly do it for 10 centimeters, but that is the closest uh, we really do any uh, analysis on a beam. Okay. But we'll go with a half a meter. We'll just take a look at this. And you can see that because the beam diameter is larger than the limiting aperture, not all the power can go through the limiting aperture. As a matter of fact, in this case, only 11.4% uh, of the power is passing through the limiting aperture. If we click right here, that'll tell us that uh, only 171 watts of the 1500 is passing through the limiting aperture and so the OD at observer range is being calculated off of this power and it says that the OD at observer range at a half a meter is 4.9. Worst case would be 5 so if we went with an OD of 6 on our eyewear we're we're uh, we're good but one of the other things that we want to know about eyewear so let's say you did put this at 0.1 so that we, we see we need a, an OD of 5.9. We also want to know the irradiance that the eyewear would be looking at. And this is, you can get that information right here. And we always want the irradiance. We really like it in 1 over E. That's what uh, standards uh, look at and that are concerned with eyewear and barriers. So this gives us the irradiance uh, at 10 centimeters from the focal point. It's 1.8 times 10 to the fourth watts per square centimeter. If you're working in square meters, that would be 1.18. Uh, you'd multiply this by 10,000 or just to add a four to this. So it'd be 1.18 times 10 to the eighth watts per square meter. Okay, depending on the standard that uh, if you're working with an eyewear manufacturer, uh, the, you know, they sometimes work in uh, square meters. So you just multiply this by uh, 10,000, that'll give you the square meters. Now, what if we were talking about, say, what the irradiance is at a barrier, and we say, uh, you know, based on the area that we have in our work cell, that barrier is going to be 1.5 meters away. Well, we'll put 1.5 meters in here and get the irradiance at 1.5 meters and 
because that's what uh, manufacturers who are doing barriers say. If you're talking to Kintec, they're going to be interested in what the irradiance is, where you think that barrier is going to be placed at 1.5 meters away from the focus spot of the laser. Okay. Other information we have is the NOHD. It tells us that this beam uh, for this setup is a hazard out to 152 meters, quite a distance. Okay. What about this nominal skin hazard distance? Uh, that's the NSHD. It's at 10.9. Why is there such a big difference? That's because these MPEs are very different. Okay. The MPE for the eye, the uh, maximum permissible exposure is uh, 5 milliwatts per square centimeter, whereas for the skin it's 1 watt per square centimeter. So uh, a big difference between these these two MPEs and that's what causes the NSHD, NSHD to be much shorter than the NOHD. Okay, um, boy, okay, oh yeah, 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 before we move on let's take a look at the diffuse here. Uh, we're saying that we have a beam on target. Let's say the beam on target is uh, the spot size here, which is going to be uh, 0 0.122. Okay. The exposure duration, uh, this is usually set a little longer, but you'll notice that the MPEs are the same. So it doesn't matter whether it's at 10 seconds or 600 seconds. As a matter of fact, you could put this all at an all-day exposure and nothing changes. Whoops, let me get an all-day exposure in here. 30,000 seconds. You'll notice the MPE doesn't change. So from 10 seconds to 30,000 seconds, uh, you have the same hazard level. Okay, and we could change this to 30,000 also. Always make sure you know what, uh, you know, check your exposure durations and think about what you want to use in these cases. And a lot of times you'll see that uh, just as we do in this case, 10 seconds and 30,000 seconds gives us the same result. Sometimes I will put 30,000 seconds in so that if we were having a discussion with anybody, uh, somebody says, well, why only 10 seconds? If you've already gone with an all-day exposure, you can say, well, we're already looking at an all-day exposure or worst case. You can explain that there's no difference if you want to, but this, will, uh, this certainly puts everybody at ease that we're really talking about uh, long-term exposures here. Here's the NHC. This uh, for a diffusely scattered... Uh, light with uh, scattering 100% of the power at a zero viewing angle. Um, oh, I put the observer range at 0.12. Sorry. Let's see. We want the beam at 0 0.122. It's not going to change anything. It's going to be a point source. And uh, the observer range, you know, for a diffuse scatter probably is going to be between a quarter and a half. I, guess, I suppose let's put uh, a quarter of a meter in there. And uh, say, for example, your operator, your welding operator is leaning over is kind of close, quarter meter away. You can see that you would need an OD at the observer range of 2.17. But if you're specking an OD of 6, that's going to cover you for a diffuse. But what if you wanted to know the uh, irradiance? We don't report this irradiance per se. Okay. So if you wanted to know the irradiance of a diffuse reflection, because you say, well, I'm, I'm only concerned with that, and I want to, I don't, you know, if I'm looking at a barrier, I may want to use a less expensive barrier. I don't want to use metal. Maybe I want to use a fabric. What is that going to be? I'm going to show you a really easy way of doing this, okay? We already have the, uh, this beam diameter in here. What we're going to do is change the divergence so that we match this NHZ and we're going to put uh, 0 0.25 so we can also match the uh, OD. And so I'm going to put uh, 0 0.122 and I'm going to look at 2875 and uh, let's see that's 1.79, 1.65, 301, 307. That's pretty close. Okay, uh, actually, I guess we could back that off just a little bit. Let's go with 0 0.122 and 2850 uh, mil ratings for a divergence. And you can see, yeah, we're pretty much uh, right on. We'll do it one more time. Yeah, I just can't help myself. 
Okay. Oh, that looks nice. Yeah, I kind of had this figured out already. But you can see where you can just, and all you're going to do is match these. So you're going to match the uh, NHC with the NOHD, and you're going to match the OD uh, with the observer range. The thing you want to make sure of is that the MPEs are the same. Okay, so you always want to use whatever exposure duration, you want to use the same exposure durations. So, and we can see that we have uh, the same OD. And so now we can come down here and read the irradiance at, uh, again, if we set our barrier is at 1.5, now we can change this to 1.5 and see what the irradiance at the barrier would be. And if you want to check that, we can change this to 1.5. Okay, and we can see that everything stays the same. Okay, so that's uh, a quick way of figuring out what the irradiance for a diffuse reflection at a particular distance is. We just use the intrabeam section once again, and that gives us the irradiance. Okay, all right, so the last one we need to look at is the single mode, so let's do that. Uh, we said that single mode diameter was 30 microns, so that's 0.03. Now, this, uh, we're at the same spot here. We don't know what the divergence is. Fortunately, for a single mode, as we just talked about, when we talk about a really nice Gaussian beam, which a single mode uh, beam is, it's, very, uh, it's a really nice Gaussian shape, uh, that's going to be somewhere between 1 and 1.1. So we're just going to go ahead and put an m squared of 1. That'll be our most conservative, and it'll give us a very uh, reasonable and real case result even though we're being conservative. So we'll just put a 1 in here. And again, we get uh, the system automatically calculates the divergence for us. All right. And we can look at the NOHD is 190. You can see this divergence is a little lower than the multimode fiber we were having, which is, uh, that's pretty typical for this stuff. Okay. So we have a little longer NOHD. The NSHD is 13.6. Okay, and uh, nothing is really going to change over here for the diffuse reflection. Uh, the only difference we would put over here is if we wanted to put uh, a smaller, you know, put that spot, uh, exact spot size in. Uh, but nothing else is going to change. And you can go through and do the same thing we did for the multimode in terms of, you know, where do you want to look at the beam at in terms of your observer, get the irradiance value and all of that. I think the last thing we want to do here is I'll just show you how to uh, generate a report. Okay, so you Go to the menu, generate the report, and yeah, uh, there's a lot of stuff highlighted in this. I've got my template set for this particular one set up a little differently. You can change these highlights. And then like if you want to include information about a radiance or anything like that, just put it in the notes. This report gives you basic information about uh, ODs, uh, NOHD, NSHD, uh, Diffuse hazard, it highlights some of the input parameters, the average power, uh, calculated values, average power, what the diameter range is. But anything else you'll just add into the notes. You can add as many notes as you want. This, uh, as you can tell, ports it into uh, Microsoft Word. And then you can just uh, save this off or print it, do whatever you want. I think that's about all. If there are any other questions, all you got to do is let us know. All right. Bye-bye.